I see familiar faces, so some of you heard me speak before, and I'm always talking about like a civil war, a genocide, a rogue, uh, you know, dictator with nuclear weapons or something of that nature. And this semester, the students came to me and said, hey, Dr. Kuznar, would you talk about love? <laughs> and I think that was their way of saying, Dr. K, would you just lighten up? <laughs> so I'm trying to lighten up today. Since it's uh, not my norm, please forgive me if uh, it's an epic fail, but at least I did my best. All right, let's see here. So, yes, I'm going to talk about the anthropology of love, sex, and valentines. Or, since I'm going to get all scientific on you, I might just ruin it for you as well, okay? <laughs> see just how boring we can make this. So first, let's start with some anthropological history. There's uh, legends about the birth of Valentines that you may not know. And uh, they're interesting legends in that they do have kernels of truth to them. It's just that historians haven't been able to fully verify exactly what happened. The holiday is rooted in a uh, pagan Roman holiday called Lupercalia uh, that was celebrated on February 15th. Uh, Rom Roman priests, the Luperci, would sacrifice a goat and a, for uh, fertility and a dog for purification. They would then skin the animals and strip their hides into long strips and soak them in blood and then run around town slapping women with them and the fields. And this was to make them fertile in the next year. And so women that wanted to have a baby would run up to these guys and they'd get all slapped and bloodied and everything. So that's the origin of this holiday that we're celebrating today. It's a fertility rite. So to use the, the words of the comedian Stephen Colbert, when did they got it up? Okay, how do we get saints involved? So uh, let's talk about St. Valentine's, because there's actually three different saints named Valentine. And two of them were executed by this guy, Claudius II. And around 270 uh, AD, he executed two Christians named Valentine. Um, according to the church, it happened on February 14th. But that may not have actually been the case. But there were these two guys, and they were sanctified. So here's the first story. Claudius II outlawed marriage for all young men because he thought unmarried men would make better soldiers for the empire. So a Christian priest named Valentine was holding secret marriage ceremonies for these young couples that wanted to be married. Uh, he was caught and executed. That's the first legend of St. Valentine. I, I went to a bunch of um, websites to do some background research, and I kept going to uh, Roman Catholic um, saint sites and educational sites, and this seems to be the St. Valentine story that they prefer. Okay. <laughs> Here's the other St. Valentine story. There's another Roman priest named Valentine uh, who was helping Christians escape prisons in Rome. And he got caught and was condemned to death, but had to stay in prison for a little while before they killed him. Um, and uh, while in prison, he started uh, converting people and fell in love with the jailer's daughter. And before he was executed, wrote her a love note signed from your Valentine. We've been doing the same ever since. So, uh, so those are the stories. Um, officially, in 494, Pope Galatius uh, declared February 14th St. Valentine's Day. He made it a saint's day. Uh, and what historians think really happened is they don't know exactly when these guys were executed, but this was the Catholic Church's way of co-opting a pagan ceremony, which is very common. Okay, just kind of slap some saints on it, got it up, and uh, people can continue their fertility rights. All right, so now we'll turn to the evolutionary biology of lust, sex, and love, which you came here for, right? 
I don't know if you've ever taken a moment to do this, and if you haven't, you really should. Take a quiet moment to sit back and reflect, why sex in the first place? And biologists have had a very good answer for a very long time. But I want you to think about why sex. Start with asking yourself, why shouldn't I be having sex? And if you have, if you're honest with yourself, you're going to come up with a lot of really good reasons why not to do this, because sex makes you stupid. <laughs> First of all, the most fundamental characteristic of a living organism is that it is life, and life seeks to replicate. So why only make half of yourself? It'd be far more efficient to just like butt off a clone like a bacterium does. Then you're there, 100% replication. So it makes no sense. It, it, you're cheating yourself. And then you got to find a mate, all right? I think a lot of us can relate to the difficulties there, such as it takes time. And it's dangerous, all right? Last week of uh, October, first week of November, the white-tailed deer in the great state of Indiana go nuts. They have a breeding season, and you see the highways and byways littered with their dead bodies. Why? Because sex makes you stupid. <laughs> and it's dangerous for other reasons as well, right? When you're meeting someone for the first time, he might kill you, as this popular meme depicts. And guys, you're not uh, exempt either. This is going back a ways, but the movie Fatal Attraction, right? It was Michael Douglas has an affair with a, a woman, and uh, then she stalks him and his family. Right? Things can get crazy. And going way back for the old folks and the me, um, there's the movie Looking for Mr. Goodbar, which very interesting film, uh, critically acclaimed, and I'd Netflix it if you want, but that's the theme, spoiler alert. Um, and if you survive that, you still have got to deal with someone else's crap. <laughs> I could go on and on. Sex makes no sense. You should avoid it. So why don't we? Why do we obsess about it? Why does it consume our lives? As I like to say, the first part of our lives are consumed with finding mates. The rest of our lives, we're paying the consequences. And there's another good biological answer for this. It's all about variety. Not variety is in the spice of life, okay? So stop your fantasizing. But in diversifying your genetic portfolio, the future is unknown and uncertain. And the best long-term bet for replicating your genes in perpetuity is to mix them up so that your offspring are variable. We never know what the future is going to be. Therefore, we don't know what genetic mix is going to be most adaptive. That's why most species on the planet reproduce sexually. Um, there are things like bacteria that reproduce asexually, uh, and they do okay, but most individual species do this. So that's why we do sex. So why love? You don't have to be in love to have sex. I think we kind of know that. Isn't that what Tinder's all about with the swiping and stuff? <laughs> Young people have to explain it to us old folks. Um, it's nature's stopping rule. Think about this. As an animal, it's the most important decision you make, most especially for females, because it's much more costly to gestate and birth and raise and everything like that. Uh, so it's a momentous decision. If you were truly a rational actor, you would carefully consider it, as this cartoon shows. And here's a problem. Today, there's roughly about 2 billion mates that you could probably have out there, considered over 7 billion people, appropriate age range, et cetera, et cetera. You've got billions of choices. If you were perfectly rational, you would never get around to having sex because you'd be considering all these things all the time. So there you go. A lot of single sites have great memes up there that illustrate this. And this is where love comes in. It short circuits your rational brain, right? It stops the search 
and get you down to business. <laughs> but we don't stay in love. And if we do, take some work over the years, okay? So, a little nitty gritty dirt band song up there. Wait. So we've got an itch. Oh, they're an old one, you, you wouldn't. <laughs> uh, I'm dating myself again. So, we do have an itch, right? There's that famous movie, The Seven Year Itch, the folklore in our society about the seven year itch, about <laughs> marriages getting rocky after seven years. We do have an itch, but it's not every seven, it's every four. Now, how do we know this? We know this because of the work of the anthropologist Helen Fisher, who's been studying this now for decades. And she studied it in human societies around the world. And regardless of human society, on average, there's a peak in the probability of divorce after four years of marriage. Despite how marriage is conceived and thought of and practiced, there's this four-year thing. So this seems to be a deeply rooted biological tendency in our psyche. She's written a number of books. I recommend them all. They're, they're a hoot. They're well-written. And they are really informative. She really has done a lot of uh, great research. So there you go. Why can't we uh, get divorced like all the other normal couples? And we do. It's common in all societies. Here's what she found out. And she's not the sole person that's done this research, but she's certainly the best known. She's someone you see on the news and stuff. She's famous for this. It's because love is a cocktail of brain chemicals. How do you feel when you're in love? Probably all of us in this room have had that feeling. And it's a very complex feeling, isn't it? She's dissected it into a number of specific kinds of feelings and the chemical basis for them. Uh, here are three uh, culprits, norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. So norepinephrine, right, when you're in love, you're attention is so focused, you're motivated, you're seeking pleasure with that person, it's intense. Dopamine makes you really alert. You notice everything they're doing, you notice when they're not there, you notice what they're doing, all right? And serotonin doesn't let you stop obsessing about that person. You are addicted to them. Actually, the areas of the brain that light up when you're addicted, that activate, activate when you're in love too. You get addicted to someone, all right? Oh, there's People actually tattoo these on their bodies and everything. Um, so, and of course, there's a dark side. When everything's going well, it's wonderful. The moment it isn't going well, it gets ugly, creepy, scary, and very depressing. So these are intense brain chemicals. And let's not forget the lust part. We produce more testosterone and estrogen. And this is what's at the root of our feelings of lust and sexual desire. And then oxytocin. Uh, a lot of people call it the love drug. I think it's misnamed. I call it the cuddle drug. Whenever you have a positive social interaction, whether it's romantic or platonic, it doesn't matter, you get that warm, fuzzy feeling, and it's just feels so good and everything, that's oxytocin talking to you. Your brain boosts the oxytocin levels, and uh, your body boosts the brain's oxytocin levels, and you feel that way. That is what that is. Um, women, after they give birth, their brains are flooded with oxytocin. And think about it. Uh, perhaps some of the women that have given birth can consult with the women who haven't yet. Um, when you consider what happens, what that baby put you through, Probably the only rational response the moment that creature is out is to take it and slap it up against the wall and be done with it. I mean, birth is hell. I know. I've seen it. And, uh, but what happens is instead of doing that, women's brains are absolutely flooded with oxytocin, and they just want to love it and love it and love it. It's the cuddle drug. Uh, the other time when there's a boost in oxytocin is after orgasm. Okay, so the warm, fuzzy feeling I cuddle up and stuff like that. Oxytocin. Men also produce a very closely related chemical, vasopressin. Uh, that has the effect of making men really sleepy. So, ladies, if you've ever had the experience of, you know, having sex and next thing you know he's snoring, don't get upset. He's not disrespecting you. It's just a vasopressin. So, 
Going back to another really old commercial, uh, per public service announcement commercial, if there's anyone out there who still isn't clear, this is your brain. And this is your brain on, not drugs, but love. <laughs> now, that you understand this, let's be honest with ourselves, folks. You can't go through life like this. You can't. You're going to wind up like a dead deer along the road. <laughs> And your body knows this. And so what your body does is after you fall in love and you have these intense things, these chemicals gradually start to be produced in smaller and smaller quantities. We fall in and we fall out of love and our bodies are programmed to do that. And guess what? It takes four years to go back to normal. And that's when people start looking at that person they couldn't live with a few years ago. It's like, why am I with you? Okay? Uh, her writings, uh, I, I especially like the, the book Why We Love, it has also recommendations based on the research findings of how to keep a relationship together if you want to. All right? And there's things you can do to kind of uh, jumpstart uh, and, and boost the love, get the love back a little bit. You know, things like do novel things together, do scary or uh, exciting things together. Not sexual things, but any kind of thing. Novelty is a key thing, right? So the person isn't novelty anymore, but you can kind of fake it a bit by doing something novel with the person, okay? So um, yeah, I really recommend her stuff. So now I want to shift into the science of attraction. That's the science of love and lust and everything like that. What attracts people? There's a lot of research on this, on this and um, so let's just get into it. There is a lot of research on pheromones, on body dimensions, I'll talk about that. Uh, symmetry, um, there's sperm wars, folks. Um, there's a ton of stuff we can't do at all. So what I did for today is just selected a few things that are well researched in terms of men's attraction to women and women's attraction to men, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of fun with it. So what turns men on? Oh, spoiler alert. None of this is going to surprise you, okay? <laughs> this is the kind of science where it's like, duh, we knew it. But you still have to do science to it to establish the empirical basis and come to a better understanding anyway. But, so no surprises here. Guys like young women, okay? Uh, they like women who are symmetrical. Uh, they like uh, body ratios, and I've got subsequent slides for this. Uh, high brows, uh, smooth skin. Uh, lips, I'll, I'll show you that, and firm breasts. Um, let's do youth first. Men like younger women, but there are limits. And I've got some graphics here that I just love uh, based on research that was done and in interviewing people about what the ideal age of a, of a mate would be. Um, here's the data from men. So green is like high preference, red is low preference. And you can see it's all low, and then it drops right off. So, so um, down here in the uh, younger age categories, given a man's age, um, that's where they're at. But then it drops off abruptly after that. And so the researchers jokingly called this the threshold of creepiness, right? So, and as you can see, lots of examples. Uh, Larry King, of course, Hugh Hefner, uh, always with young wives. And let's not forget the President of the United States of America. Okay? So we see this uh, over and over again. And <clears throat> so there you go. Uh, no surprise. Oh, I want to comment on that, on why that is, though. Um, there are two things that indicate uh, a woman's reproductive value. That's a biological term. We apply it to all animals. You know, so when you've got an individual, how many more offspring can that individual reproduce? And one is fecundity, the, your natural fertility is a technical term, uh, your natural ability to you know, produce eggs that can be inseminated, all that kind of stuff. The other one is youth. It's very basic. The leading factor, and we've studied this in cultures all over the world, in different kinds of societies, small hunter-gatherer bands, modern societies like ours, the earlier you start reproducing, the more offspring you can have. It's that simple. So if any of you are sitting there and it matters to you, not that it should, but, it, but you want to like win the evolutionary game, if you're female especially, you got to drop out of school. We are wrecking your uh, reproductive fitness uh, and you got to get cracking. 
you got to get reproducing because uh, time's a ticking. Men like curvy women. And this is the 0.7 hip to waist ratio. Uh, so there's a couple diagrams of how you would measure it. Uh, and so uh, there's these standard uh, uh, images of women from different angles and stuff. Men are asked to pick which ones they prefer. And uh, this is the one always. This is cross-cultural. Um, there's a few societies where there's been a deviation. It's usually not much of a deviation. Um, but uh, it, it's amazing how regular this is around the world. And if you look at famous examples, so there's Marilyn Monroe, uh, Gina Lola Brigida. Uh, all the way over here, you've got um, the Venus de Milo. And when I first did this lecture, I was looking up data on famous women with 0.7 hip to waist ratios. And there's this person who's recent, and I've forgotten her name, but she's, I guess she's famous. Um, but this illustrates something. It's not body size. It's body proportions. Look at Marilyn Monroe here versus this woman here who's incredibly thin, but she's not straight thin. The relative proportions are the key. And what that is indicating is the narrower waist is an indicator of youth and that you haven't had too many babies yet. Getting back to reproductive value, okay? And there's more curves to talk about, such as what is often called the booty. Now part of that obviously uh, relates to uh, fatty deposits in the buttocks and, uh, and everything, but there's more to it than that that's very biological and directly related to reproductive fitness. It's the lumbar curvature, right? So your lower vertebrae, your lumbar vertebrae, they curve out a bit, but we don't all curve the same way and it turns out that the 45.5 degree curvature is the optimal curvature for the whole pelvic girdle for giving birth. And so that's part of what's going on there. And they actually sell panties that will give you more of that if you don't have it. Booty pop panties. I just, okay. This uh, came out uh, just this past year. Um, uh, lips. Uh, men like curvy lips. Uh, this is only one study uh, in everything done with uh, Caucasian women, so there's clearly limitations. This is something that if any of our students go on looking for a dissertation topic, this would be a thing that needs expanding. Uh, and what they found is that this uh, one to two uh, lip ratio of upper to lower was the one that was most desired by men, so that was kind of breaking news. And then breasts. This just came out maybe a month or so ago, maybe two months ago. Um, once again, no, no surprises here, all right. Um, first of all, there's actually uh, studies going back to, I think, 1992 on this, uh, but there's uh, yet another one published uh, just a couple months ago. Uh, one of the studies did eye tracking. So men were presented with images of women, this image in particular, and then the computer looked at where their eyes went. So. For the women in the room, if you've ever had that experience where you're having a conversation with a guy and you want to say, you know, the, road, the words are coming out from up here, um, this is what's going on. Yeah, A, for about half the men, women's breasts are the first thing their eyes lock onto, and of all body parts, that's where their eyes dwell the longest, okay? Uh, secondarily, they look at the hips. So basically men are programmed to check out the, um, the indicators of re reproductive value. Um, and then ptosis. This is the, the study that came out a couple months. Ptosis uh, refers to sagginess of the breast. It's a technical term. Uh, there's research on this going back to the 1950s actually. Not for purposes of understanding our um, behavior, but for breast reconstruction, stuff like this. This is something that comes from the medical field. And uh, so there's standard diagrams for ptosis, and they've been uh, done in Western societies. They've been done in Highland New Guinea and tribal societies and everything. And large breasts are an indicator of estrogen production. Estrogen is, impor is important for fecundity. But firm breasts, uh, breasts are an indication of youth. 
And so here you've got an indicator that's hitting the two fundamental indicators of a woman's future reproductive output. And so fertility is a function of both of these. And yes, men prefer larger, but that's a secondary consideration. And there's actually a lot of uh, cross-cultural variation and men's preferences for the size of breasts. So American men are renowned for having an obsession with the bigger the better. And most men in the world take a more measured approach to that. But all men like firm breasts. It's a signature of youth. So it would be unfair to dwell on only what's turning men on. So what's turning the women on? Symmetry. And we can come back to some of these things that I, I haven't talked specifically about because there's reasons for them. Uh, there you go, hairy torso. That hairy torso study, I think that is uh, culture specific because it was done in Britain. And so, you know, the whole Sean Connery, hairy chest thing, uh, no one's ever replicated anywhere else. As a matter of fact, in East Asia, they found the opposite. So I think that is not a biological thing, that's a cultural thing. But I had to have him there anyway. <laughs> Men have proportions too. You're not off the hook, guys. The ideal hip to waist ratio for men is 0.9, right? So men are still gonna have a bit of a hip, but they need to come in at the waist a little bit, or should, a little bit, okay? And, uh, so, and that uh, holds up very well. I love this one. Those ancient Greeks would discover stuff that keeps revealing itself as true over and over again in the oddest ways. And one of these things, I've got a mathematician in the, in the crowd here beaming right now. It makes my day. And uh, the golden ratio. So it's, it's what you see there. You know, the combination of A and B uh, is the, this ratio of A to B and, and everything. It comes up time and time again. So the two guys here, they actually have the uh, golden ratio of shoulders to um, waist here. Um, that's, oh, who's the guy who did the, uh, Jane? Thank you, Daniel Craig. He just kind of looks like he has it, so I threw him up there. <laughs> but we see it in statuary throughout time. You know, it comes up over and over again. So guys, work those shoulders, okay? <clears throat> and once again, st there's standard instruments that are used. Uh, to study this cross-culturally, so everyone's using the same imagery and everything, and those are your two guys there. So yeah, work on your shoulders, but um, if you obsess about them, like I saw a great program one time on guys that obsess about making their biceps really ginormous and everything like that, you're missing the point. All right, a, a little uh, scene from that uh, document, it was actually a documentary, uh, they were uh, interviewing a guy with, whose biceps literally were like that, and he said he did it so he could go in a bar and he loved that other men's girlfriends would come over and want to squeeze them. But it was clear this guy never got out himself. Do you get it? He was missing the point. We call that runaway evolution, okay, in, in biology. So there you go. Now for men, age is not so important, or I'm sorry, for women, age is not so important. As a matter of fact, uh, women tend to prefer men a few years older than them. Uh, one of our colleagues, um, uh, David Buss, I believe it was, um, he did a study, 13,000 people around the world, and the average, and it was a pretty consistent average, no matter what society he was in, was four years. Women preferred men several years older than them, but pretty close. Okay, and so, and, and believe it or not, men that could be too young. And I like what these researchers did here. They dubbed that the cliffs of immaturity. So, you know, guys grow up a little bit. <clears throat> the women prefer it. And just to, the, it does stark, starkly contrast with men's preferences. Okay, bad boys, okay. We have, of course, a scientific Boring term for this, it's called the novel male syndrome. This was first discovered in rhesus macaques. We have since discovered that it's a pretty pervasive pattern in the monkeys that are most closely related to us and in human behavior as well. Women prefer men who are high status, um, who protect resources, um, but they, that's their one main 
um, preference. Uh, I said women, I meant females because that's what we see in non-human primates as well. Or guys they never saw before. Ergo the novel male syndrome. And um, so there you go. Oh, and who is that? James Dean. So this is part, the novel male, the original bad boy, right, is part of our own heritage here in the great state of Indiana. All right. And then, and I wanted some dramatic music to build this up and didn't put it in. Thank you. That's actually what I was going to play. The triumph of evolution, the human penis. Why is it such a magnificent thing? Well, because it's ginormous. An adult male gorilla will weigh about 400 pounds. That's a lot of body mass. The average male in the world, male human, is 150. About the same for the average chimpanzee. And yet the penises are radically different in size. For, and I love this image. You have to blow it up in the photograph to see the gorilla's penis. It's incredibly tiny. And so that, you know, these two uh, graphs on the bar chart here, this is overall length, and then this is overall volume in cubic inches. Chimpanzees are bigger, but not a whole lot to um, write home about. Uh, about. They average about three and a half uh, inches erect, whereas the gorilla is only about an inch and a quarter erect in length. Uh, but they're very, very thin, so very low volume. And then you have humans, okay? Um, that's a, a famous geoglyph, Neolithic period in England, and the, the artist may have been exaggerating things a little bit maybe, I don't know, but um, it makes the point, doesn't it? And indeed, the human penis is off the charts. Not so much in length, although it's definitely longer than any other uh, primates, um, but volumetrically it is. So guess what? At least at some point in our evolutionary past, size mattered. But you know, nature, I like to say, has its own sick sense of humor. And it's about the baculum, or the penis bone. Most species have a bone in the penis to maintain erection for the obvious, you know, necessary thing of insemination. So there's a collection of uh, bacula there from different species. And uh, monkeys have them. You know, a rhesus macaque, small animal, has one about an inch and a half long, pretty much corresponding to its penis size. And you can appreciate how that would help the mechanics of sex. And here's a depiction of um, the bacula sizes of different species of apes. So orangutans and gorillas, they have uh, one that's, um, oh, a little more than an inch. So, you know, pretty much doing the job for their teeny tiny penises. Um, chimpanzees, smaller. Nature robbed the humans of their baculum. Humans don't have one. No assistance there, okay? Performance anxiety, folks, this is the root of it. So there's a lot of speculation and theorizing about how do we lose our baculum and why? Now, penis size itself isn't everything, but Size is, it comes up in a lot of different ways. Uh, these are a number of different diagrams that illustrate things like penis size, testicle size, um, female vocalization, um, where the curves are on females. It's very interesting. In species that are um, harem species or polygynous, that's where only a few males or maybe just one male does all the mating. The penises are microscopic, not truly, but they're very tiny. Um, and, um, and the testicles are extremely small. And it's for a very simple reason. It takes energy to make all this sex stuff. And our bodies are fairly efficient in how they use that energy. If you're the only game in town, you don't have to put energy into your sexual apparatus and your sperm and everything because that you've got exclusive access and the little bits of sperm you're gonna be introducing are gonna be enough eventually. But if there's a lot of competition, if females are having uh, sex with multiple males, for instance, we call that promiscuity, we don't mean anything by it, but it's the technical term, then you gotta do something about that. 
and um, there's still a lot of speculation as to why humans have such enormous penises, um, but uh, no speculation on testicle size. Chimpanzees are promiscuous maters, and um, the males don't compete a whole lot with one another, like overtly, for access to females, but they have absolutely enormous testicles. They're absolutely gigantic. And so as an indicator of how restricted or promiscuous mating is in a species past, all you have to do is look at the size of the testicles in relation to the overall body size, and you have your answer. So inquiring minds would want to know, where do the humans fall? And we are weird. We don't have chimpanzee-sized testicles, but we absolutely do not have the tiny testicles that you see in other uh, species. We're like right in between. So there's evidently throughout our evolutionary past, some degree of multi-male mating was probably a typical feature of human, human preferences. There we are. Oh, I was just illustrating two ends of the spectrum. Okay. And then, the deep mystery of life, as Madeline Kahn sang in Young Frankenstein. If you remember the scene, for those of you that haven't seen it, please go see it. It's, uh, it's a great one. They, actually, the uh, Civic Center did a great rendition of it on, on stage uh, last year. So maybe we'll bring it back. They did a great job, I thought. All right, the female orgasm, an absolute rarity in nature. There are a couple other species that exhibit it, which is interesting. One is uh, one of our near relatives, the bonobo or pygmy chimpanzee. Um, but pretty much it's absent because you don't need it to reproduce. So why do we have it? Of course, there's got to be a controversy. I mean, of course, someone's got to ruin the orgasm, right? Um, one theory is that it's a vestigial response. It's a term from biology, evolutionary biology. So, for instance, all humans we have, were born with an appendix. It's part of our digestive system. But ours is shriveled up and it doesn't function. We don't use it. Animals that eat a lot of buds and things like that, they use it. It's used to digest that kind of material. We don't eat that kind of stuff. We probably haven't eaten that kind of stuff for millions of years. It's atrophied, all right? It's, it's shrunk up, we don't use it. And so one theory is that the female orgasm is a vestigial response. It's something that women don't need, but because men have it, there's like this genetic spillover, you know, because we do share a lot of genes. It's just that one chromosome that men and women don't share. So uh, women have a bit of this response. Nipples on a man. Why? No reason. Okay? Vestigial response. And in nature, we see this all the time. Like, uh, Lizards with uh, non-functioning um, legs. They kind of slither around like snakes, but they're lizards because they have like little lizard legs. Uh, we see this a lot in nature. This comes from uh, not a biologist, but a um, feminist uh, philosopher of science named Elizabeth Lloyd, who says the case of the female orgasm bias in the science of evolution. She maintains that it's an, a mistake of nature, basically. It's a vestigial response. And that the reason why anyone ever suggested that it was adaptive was because of sexism. Um, and it's because most of the biologists that said so were male, and she saw a male agenda in saying that it was um, uh, adaptive. It was actually something that assisted with reproduction. Uh, she, in her book, she points out less than 20% of women reliably achieve orgasm solely through uh, intercourse. 34% uh, of women who rarely or never experience orgasm reproduce as well, a number of things. Okay. And then the other side of the coin comes from biologists who have maintained several different theories. So there's dispute about what's really going on here as to how a female orgasm can be adaptive. And so the most tasteful rendition I could give you was uh, Meg Ryan's fake orgasm and when Harry met Sally. One is that it's a simple matter of motivation. Hey, orgasms can be pretty fun. Maybe it makes females more inclined to want to do the thing that is necessary to reproduce. Okay, old theory. Another one is actually called the upsuck hypothesis. This is based on unfortunately only one study, so it needs to be replicated. 
Uh, and what they did is they had couples have sex, and then they had the women stand up afterward and then collect semen that leaked back out of their vaginas, and then they tested that semen for sperm count. And I should say they tested the men before sex as well, so they knew what the man's sperm count should be. And what they found is women that had orgasms that were timed right, uh, the, um, the, the, the uh, seminal fluid that leaked out had a lower sperm count, indicating that the rhythmic uh, motions of the orgasm were uh, differentially sucking sperm up into their uterus. Okay, ergo the upsuck hypothesis. Another one is fluctuating asymmetry. It turns out that, um, and there's several studies now uh, of different situations, women are more likely to orgasm if a guy is very symmetrical. Okay? Men like symmetrical features on women too. Here's what's up with that. Our bodies are programmed to grow symmetrically, but throughout our lives we get different shocks diseases, things like that, that shock the system. And so we don't grow perfectly symmetrical. So the more symmetrical you are is an indicator of how resistant you are to these shocks in life and therefore an indicator of good genes, okay? Um, symmetrical men, women orgasm more than asymmetrical men. Uh, when they're cheating on a mate, they're more likely to orgasm. Uh, and there's a couple other situations like that. Um, and then orgasm as the evaluation of male support. Uh, you know, um, having a guy have to work a bit harder might differentiate the guys that are worth keeping than the guys that are gonna dump you. And, uh, and I mentioned the cheating orgasm. So, number of different theories. So, there's controversy on, on a number of levels about this, but it's an interesting thing, of course, to study. The first person who ever did a official and formal scientific study of the female orgasm was Princess Marie Bonaparte. <laughs> Interesting character. She was a psychiatrist. She was the great grandniece of Napoleon himself. This has nothing to do with the talk, but she ransomed Freud from the Nazis. She saved him. In 1924, she published an article uh, on the female orgasm. She was talking with friends, and they were talking about their orgasms, and they were talking about their anatomy, and she hit on maybe there's something about the position of the clitoris in relation to the rest of the external organs on females that might have something to do with orgasms. So she did a study of it, and what she found was the one inch rule. Uh, if there is one inch or less between the clitoris and the urethral opening, those women regularly orgasm. If it's greater than that, then they don't orgasm as much. And so this was a study done in 1924. There was a follow-up study done by other researchers in 1940 and then nothing else since. Isn't that amazing? So. What about the clitoris? It's amazing. I really did a thorough search of the literature, and there's almost nothing known about the clitoris. There are a couple articles that I'm going to uh, reference here in a moment. They're like the only ones. They are recent, though, so there's been a resurgence of interest in the clitoris. I like the Amy um, uh, Schumer uh, quote there. All right, one of those official studies was of four cadavers of 80-year-old women. Our bodies do change throughout our lives. And now that I'm on the downhill side of my life, I can assure you young people, none of them are good changes. Um, <laughs> so uh, th that's a dubious study. Um, in 2009, there was an MRI study of 10 women, okay, so you could get three-dimensional imagery. And uh, it confirmed something that was already known but just not studied. What we typically think of when we think of the clitoris is the part that you can see. But the vast majority of that erectile organ is deep inside a woman's body and it wraps around the vaginal canal. And one of the things that I fault medical researchers on, they act dumbfounded about this uh, variability in female orgasms. 
It's like, haven't they ever done surgery? No two organs are alike. We're all very variable. Might it not be the proximity of those erectile tissues around the vaginal canal that could vary and therefore be explaining some of this stuff? People have yet to ask the question. It's shocking to me. Now, one per that person that is asking the question, she's the only one doing research on this, is Nan Weiss. She's the orgasm expert. And what she does is she has women uh, getting fMRIs, which if you've ever had one, you know, you've got to be still and everything. And then she has them orgasm. It's got to be tricky, all right, uh, in, in everything. And, uh, and be stimulated in different ways. And she looks at what parts of the brain activate. There you go, Nan Wise, she's at Rutgers. Um, she has a website entitled Donating Orgasms to Science. So she open an invitation for women to come into the lab and contribute to science. Uh, I'm really curious, knowing how it, MRI works, how they did the actual sexual intercourse ones. That had to be tricky as all get out. But um, they, there you go, ask Dr. Nan, so um, if you're interested. So, she pointed this out, and this is just so true. She has an uh, open call for real science and maybe some rationality about uh, female uh, sexual response. There she is. And I love this quote. And it's true. Science knows more about certain areas of outer space than it does about certain areas inside a woman's vagina. Humans obsess about sex all the time We've done it for as long as there's been science, and yet how can we know so little? And I believe that's where I was going to end. Oh, no, I wasn't. I was going to complain about something. Then I'll, then I'll exit the stage. So I had this brilliant idea. I was going to invent a drug cocktail so people could fall in love. Because it's not just about the Viagra, folks. right? If you want the whole thing, you need to come up with the cocktail, put it all in one pill, and you're good to go. It was a genius idea. The problem is, it's been done. Um, so there you go. Uh, yeah, so imagine that you're a young woman married to one of those old guys and you're bored and stuff like that and it's just not happening for you. You could take a drug, wouldn't that be great? Well, what's a girl to do? You do this. Take a drug cocktail. People already do this. Um, testosterone is given to women to boost their sex drive. This is not done a whole lot because uh, they grow facial hair and get other uh, characteristics that women would generally rather not have. Um, there's a drug, uh, Fibanserin, uh, that puts the brakes on serotonin and uh, it, it, that uh, puts the brakes on inhibitions so we can release inhibitions. That's a much safer way of boosting uh, libido in women. Um, Viagra does help with uh, putting, you know, shunting blood down to the genitals and stuff like that. And and this is not FDA approved, so please do not take this as an endorsement, but people actually have oxytocin parties. They tend not to be sexual, but like a group of friends will get together, and I guess online you can get no spray oxytocin, and the evening is, instead of getting drunk and saying, hey, I love you, man, um, you just snort oxytocin and feel good about one another. So. I was beaten to it. I'll leave it there, because oh my goodness, I've gone 52 minutes. I hope that was a bit of a fun romp through uh, the science of sex. Any questions? Okay, if none, then uh, thank you very much for coming. I hope that was uh, entertaining and informative.